my privilege to be here today with the best sportscaster in the entire world. Man, that was a great introduction. That's I appreciate awesome. it. Uh, you know what? I have a, I have a great time uh, doing what I do. I'm, what, 33 years now doing TV, and uh, I, I always tell everybody, man, at the end of the day, I, I could have a bad day, and it's really not a real bad day because every day I'm covering sports, and they actually pay me to do that. Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> Uh, no, it's been a, a great run in, in a business I really enjoy, and uh, I know that the media and the broadcasting business, uh, you know, gets a lot of criticism, uh, especially on the national level. I definitely understand that, but I think on the local level in most markets, especially here in Houston, I think we do a nice job—not just sports, but news coverage and the way we uh, bring balanced coverage. And uh, it, it's a, I still have a blast doing what I do, or I'd be doing something else for sure. But I really enjoy it. And you know, we just finished the NFL draft last week and, <laughs> and maybe week four and, you know, just you know, Texas got a new coach. It kind of takes us in the football world for a minute, if you don't mind. It's yeah, I mean, it's a, we were just talking, a few of us were talking beforehand uh, how the NFL has really, in a smart way, uh, transformed the way they do business. It's not just August or September to end of December or, you know, end of January of the Super Bowl and it's over. They now milk this thing year round as best they can because they want to be in the news basically year round. And they've found a way actually to do that because not long after the Super Bowl, you got all the hype now of uh, players coming out of college, getting ready for the combine. That leads to the draft. And then all of a sudden you look up and just like recently, a couple weeks ago, we had the draft and it's the end of April. And uh, later this week, I'll be out at NRG Stadium for the first rookie camp. Uh, for the Texans, so we'll get a chance to see all these new guys on the field. Uh, you might get a little bit of a break in the, after the mi middle part of June when they have the mandatory minicamp, and uh, we hope everybody shows up to that. You never know, some players hold out, but uh, but then you get a little bit of a break until late July, and that's when it, when it ramps up really yeah. full force. So. so how do you think the Texans did? You know what? I. I think they were aggressive, and I think for the first time in the history of the team, and. Uh, I've, I've gotten to cover the team since they began uh, in, in 2002 because those first two years I was at Fox Sports Net Southwest up in Dallas and we, we were a regional network so we were down here all the time so I remember when this thing started and uh, you think back to all the years of the draft and you know when you have that high draft pick that means that season before for the most part was pretty bad and uh, but I think they, they uh, were aggressive uh, I think Nick Casario, general manager and new head coach D'Amico Ryans, uh, didn't hold back. Uh, they, they got C.J. Stroud. Now, if you watch Sports Sunday and stuff, I, I was not wowed by this quarterback class. I'm not an expert. I watch and I, I listen and all that kind of stuff. None of the quarterbacks, in, in my opinion, were like locked down franchise quarterbacks, in my opinion. Like they're going to have good careers. But I don't think even Bryce Young, who went number one, I, I, my first question is, can he handle the physical side of the NFL with his size? Is he going to be durable? Uh, C.J. Stroud's got size. He's really good in the pocket, according to the analysts. Um, but can he develop? In a, you know, you've had classes before where these quarterbacks, you're maybe a quarterback coming out and saying, all right, that guy has to be number one. I wasn't really there. So uh, I'm anxious to see what C.J. Stroud does. Um, he definitely is a, is a winner. He comes from a great program. Uh, he does what it takes to win on that field. He's a leader off the field as well uh, in that locker room. Uh, he's a man of faith. I mean, they got good character guys. When you look at this group, just about every one, they would have nine players. I want to say seven or eight of them maybe, I believe, were captains on their team. So they got character guys coming in. Now, will that translate? We'll find out. I don't think you know immediately. I think it takes really a couple of years to, to watch these guys develop. But um, I thought they did well. And then the trade up was a, a, an aggressive move. They gave up a lot to get Will Anderson. Uh, but that's the guy I really liked, Will Anderson. And um, I mean, together, hopefully, they're a nice one two punch on either side of the ball. Uh, Will Anderson's a beast out there. And I think he's going to fit in very nicely to what. D'Amico Ryans is going to run uh, defensively, and I know he's the head coach, but D'Amico will have a heavy influence on his defense. That's one reason he's the head coach. I mean, the job he did through the ranks and uh, coming up through the ranks with the 49ers, 
He started as a quality control coach, I believe, and just impressed everybody, Kyle Shanahan, the coach there. And man, just kept raising the bar and you know, new positions each year, and he rose quickly. Um, I, I, I love D'Amico. Yeah. I love what he brings. I can already tell the buzz is back in the city with that hire. Uh, having a chance to, to cover him. When, I mean, I remember when he got drafted, interviewing him on direct, when they brought him in the next day to interview, I did the interviews. And uh, he was a winner back then. And talking to some of these veteran players, that rookie season for D'Amico, he stepped right in and was a leader in that locker room, which you don't see a lot. But uh, this is an exciting class. And, um, you know, my favorite name in the class is Juice Scruggs. His name's Juice. You got to love that name. He's the second round guy. They moved up to get him. Um, He's a center, and I believe out of Penn State. I don't have the list in front of me, but anyway, uh, they've got some players. It's all about development, and uh, we'll see how these guys develop. Um, how about the Astros? How many Astro fans are in here? Yeah. I, I'm a diehard baseball guy, as Don Mitch. I played growing up, and uh, that's my favorite. I mean, I cover them all. I love them all, but my favorite is the Astros. Uh, as a kid, uh, I grew up going to the Astrodome. My dad was a, along with some other business partners, was a longtime season ticket holder. And unbelievable seats. I remember it was like second or third row by the visitor's dugout at the uh, Astrodome. This was during the time when the Dodgers were this unbelievable Cincinnati Reds, the big red machine. But, uh, I remember screaming at Tommy Lasorda all the time, along with his other fans there at the Astrodome. Uh, you know, it was fun. I've always just been a diehard fan, and what they've been able to accomplish. Uh, this has been a uh, an era of Astros baseball that I don't think anybody's seen before. And you go back to 2015 when it all started, when AJ Hinch arrived. Um, and I hate that he's not here now, but I definitely love what Dusty Baker does for the for the for the franchise too. So they they got a winner in Dusty as well. Uh, but it started in 2015, and uh, the winning culture began. Some of these guys started to grow up a little bit. Uh, Jose Altuve was still kind of coming into it. He was already a good player, but he was still only a few years into the big league uh, run for him. Uh, and man, I tell you what, and here we are in 2023, and it's still going. It, it's, a, it's a remarkable run. You've got championships now, and um, if you're an Astros fan, this is what it's all about. They had a big win last night. I don't know if anybody stayed up late to watch the big battle between Shohei Otani and Fran Valdez, and Valdez uh, mowed him down. Man, he had 12 strikeouts. They beat Shohei, and it's like, okay, don't count these Astros. They may be out of the gate slow this year, but uh, they're missing pieces, and the fact that they're sitting here uh, 500 right now, considering what they're dealing with, says a lot about the potential of this team again when they get some healthy guys uh, back and hopefully Jose Altuve is really close to starting to play in Sugarland. so get those Space Cowboy tickets when you have a chance. Uh, he'll be rehabbing I think within a week and uh, Michael, Michael Brantley's up, Chaz McCormick is back, but uh, they get some pitching, they're going to be all right again. So one of, one of our interests is, or one of my interests, I love hearing about defining moments in, in a man's life. Uh, you know, we've all got them. And I always say the defining moment is a moment we pass through, the result of which life is never the same again, which is technically true about every moment. Right? But we know that there are those moments that, that shape and direct us kind of unlike any others. And so, you know, I'd love to hear sort of your run up to where you are in life, both, you know, uh, how you end up doing what you end up doing. I mean, mm -hmm. probably most of us dream of being a sportscaster. You know, as soon as the, the dream of being a, pro player died, maybe you know, right. we, we entertained that notion. So how did you end up doing that? And then, then what, are the, what are the defining moments along the way that let you to be in the, the man that you are? So just, just go with your story. Maybe. Well, I mean, for me, uh, I definitely have a love, had a love for sports growing up. I played just about everything you can imagine. Uh, growing up, I was a very competitive. I still remember now when I was about seven years old, a YMCA soccer game that uh, did not turn out the result I wanted and uh, got a nice lecture from my dad on the walk home from the <laughs> park after it was a complaint about the referee. So the competitiveness has always been in me. Uh, I like to win. There's no, and I still do in, in what I do for a living because it's a very competitive business we're in. And 
if, if you're not in it to win, you're going to get run over and you got, you got to be aggressive and the, there's a lot of parts to that and I'll get into that. But uh, growing up, I mean, I just remember um, I was fascinated watching TV news. I don't know why it was on in our house and this is back growing up in the 70s and, uh, you know, and you didn't have cable back then or anything, you just had the main channels. And I, would, I was just, it's hard to explain, but I was fascinated watching the guys, men and women on TV, and how they got pictures and video from not only sports, but news stuff all across the world, all, all across the globe. And I just remember, I, it was appointment viewing for me as a kid, and I, I always got kidded about it by my parents, but I just loved doing it. So I kind of fell in love with that uh, and continue that in the high school. And I went to Bel Air High School and I got out in 1985, so it's been a while. So, but back then it was rare and that's pretty common now, but back then we had our own TV station within Bel Air High School. Oh. And uh, the band director of all people was uh, just a media junkie guy and he knew how to set it all up. And we would do live uh, newscast, sportscast, uh, like three or three times a week during the lunch hours, we'd be in a makeshift studio in the band hall. He wired through the ceiling into the main cafeteria a couple hundred yards away. I don't know how he did it back in that age, but he got it done. So we do like live newscasts in our, in our cafeteria. So I was able to really enjoy that aspect of it and stay, stay uh, glued to that type of business. And I got out of Bel Air and, uh, I, I walked on for two years at Sam Houston. Back then, scholarships were fairly limited, and, and Sam Houston's a D1 now, but back then they weren't. So, you know, you get there, you come out of a program like Bel Air, we played at a pretty high level, you, you think you're pretty good, but then you get to college, you realize, man, everybody's really good when you get here. <laughs> and uh, you are, you know, I played second base and third base, and I was behind all conference guys, so I knew it was gonna be an uphill battle, but. All I wanted was a shot, and the coach, uh, back then me and a couple of teammates were what they, at the time, called recruited walk-ons. We were encouraged to come, not promised anything, but we, were, we knew we were gonna get a shot. And uh, so I gave it a shot for two years. Uh, you know, it's hard to crack it in the spring, and you're behind guys, and walking away from it was tough because that's, that was my love. Uh, my dad loved, still to this day loves baseball. He played at Oklahoma State. Uh, he, he was on the uh, 1959, way back, uh, NCAA World Series championship team in Omaha. And he walked on to Oklahoma State after playing some basketball, because he loved baseball, and he turned out to be the starting left fielder. And he got hot, did, had a pretty good year, uh, had no speed, average arm, but he could hit. And um, not with power, he was a singles, doubles guy. And uh, anyway, he ended up making the, uh, uh, all tournament, the World Series, anyway, a bunch of memories. So baseball was a part of our family growing up, and I just fell in love with the game for sure. And, uh, and then it, going to Sam Houston back on the, my career, they had a, a great broadcast journalism department, still do to this day, and uh, really got involved even when I was playing baseball and then when I quit, uh, jumped in. Uh, the Dan Rather building opened. Dan Rather was a Sam Houston graduate. The Dan Rather building opened when I was my first year there. And uh, really got involved in anything I could get my hands on to get experience. It led to internships and uh, all kinds of great experience that I wouldn't trade for anything. And it helped prepare me to, to jump in when I graduated in 89. I was actually working that last year and a half, two years of college. I had interned a couple times at where I am now, Channel 2, which is weird and at Channel 11. But then I got hired through building some contacts, I got hired at Channel 13 as a weekend sports producer. Now those of you who have been in Houston a while, they used to have a guy named Tim Melton on weekends. Oh, yeah. And uh, Tim's a friend of mine still. Uh, but I was Tim's producer and I was, it was a part, actually I'd done my internships, learned a lot. They actually hired me. I said, you're gonna pay me? You're gonna pay me to do this? Oh, nice. okay. A uh, little part-time job on weekends, but I gave up my weekends. I'd go to school during the week, drive back home, you know, uh, say hi to mom and dad, and off to work I went 10, 12 hours a day, and I was Tim's guy. And I, he did, you know, he was the sportscaster, but I did the behind-the-scenes stuff for him, and man, it was 
he was one of my great mentors in the business and Same still way. I reach out to him for advice and he's helped me along the way from my career because uh, uh, when I got out in 89, May of 89, uh, a couple months later in July, I landed my first job at the NBC in Port Arthur, Texas and uh, jumped at it. Weekend sports anchor reporter, didn't pay me hardly anything. I was like, I'm there, sign me up, let's do it. And uh, anyway, I ended up staying there a year and then went to the station in Beaumont for another six, seven years. But I always leaned on Tim a lot for a lot of advice, whether to move, move on to somewhere else. Um, but God's really blessed my career with opportunities because he knows it's not in my DNA to move around across the country like a lot of people do in our business. I just wasn't anything I was interested interested in. I'm a Texas guy. I'm a Houston guy. Uh, I remember early on praying for an opportunity to be able to work in my hometown. And wow. when this opportunity opened, uh, I'd worked in Beaumont. Then I went up to Dallas for Fox Sports Net. I was at a dream job up there at Fox Southwest, basically a regional ESPN, basically is the best way to describe it. And we were on in five states every night, so really good exposure. Uh, but we got to cover a lot, high school, Big 12, all the pro teams in the region. Uh, it was great, opened a lot of doors for me. I started doing a lot of play-by-play -play then, which is another passion of mine and still is today. I still get to do a lot of play-by-play -play up on the side. Um, but the door opened to come to Houston uh, out of nowhere. Uh, and uh, long story short, God opened the door to bring me here, I know, a great opportunity. But I always tell people, at the time in life, uh, some things were going on. My parents had gotten divorced uh, after many, many years. Uh, relationship issues going on. And I, to this day, as cool of a job as it has been, and I've now gone on 20 years at Channel 2 almost, um, I'm, I'm convinced God opened the door to come back here to say, all right, I'm going to give you a job, but you know, I want you to come back home and let's get these relationships repaired. Wow. Um, you know, especially with my mom. And uh, I think she would agree on that because, you know, when you're not speaking, I mean, my mom, just to, just to be frank with everybody, my, my mom found out I, I got the job at Channel 2 in the Houston Chronicle. Uh, I know, it's like, you know, with no relationship going on, uh, it was tough. It was yeah, weird. Sure. And it took me a while to pick up that phone and take that first step knowing I needed, you know, I knew God was telling me, you know, I've got you here for a reason, man. You know, wow. take care so, of business here. What pushed you over the edge on that one? I mean, you know, reconciliation, that's a, that's a powerful dynamic, right? So what, what was the, yeah. why, what finally made you dial the number, dial the number, you know, I, God was speaking to me, man. I felt the Holy Spirit was telling me, this is what you got to do. I mean, it's not going to just happen. Be a man, take that step, and um, open the door, reopen the door. Um, there's a lot to go through. Uh, it had been a rough few years, for sure, for our, you know, for our whole family, not just yeah, me. Sure. And um, I, I, as weird as it was to finally do that, it was a, I had a piece that, all right, this is step one of many, and I get it. And so I always tell people, you know, I, I, I just know that, you know, you just know stuff, you know, and I know that I know that's why God brought me here. Um, wow. And my mom and I, you know, 20 years later now, great relationship um, with all the family. And um, so I, I always like to make sure I share that part of it. But that's great. that first step was tough. <laughs> first step yeah, was it tough. Is. I mean, always is. You yep. know, it feels so awkward or daunting or like, Right. It's going to somehow be the end of you, and it can, it can be renewing. That's great. Yeah, you mentioned God brought you here. Tell us a little bit about that part of your life, and yeah. your, your faith journey, and you know what brought you to that, and how that's been, and what that means to you. Yeah, uh, we grew up, uh, you know, people thought we were the Cleaver family from Leave it to Beaver, and uh, we weren't inside those doors for sure. Um, yeah. We, we grew up in and out of churches, to be honest with you, never connected. Uh, we tried several in the area. Um, you know, for me, it was difficult going to youth groups, not knowing a lot of the people maybe I went to school with, and I, I just wasn't going to thrive, personally, wasn't going to thrive in that environment. 
And I remember we were going to, you know, uh, in my teenage years, we landed at Second Baptist, Ed Young, loved, and still to this day love hearing Ed Young preach. And, uh, but getting involved in the youth group at Second Baptist was not something that worked for me. Uh, I remember going, almost dreading after church, going to uh, the, the, the youth group that, on Sunday mornings because, like, man, I don't know anybody here. I'm uncomfortable. This is... Uh, this is not what I want to be doing. So I would still go sometimes, but I would also sometimes roam out and catch the next service. My mom and dad never knew that. But, uh, but anyway, what, what turned my life around was, uh, and y'all have had some speakers here before that have been involved, I would imagine, but uh, a group called Young Life. Um, young Life turned my life around. Um, my Young Life leader, uh, uh, is a guy named Roger Wordnett who runs the, the, the gathering. A lot of guys here. Everybody knows life. Roger. Roger was my Young Life leader. Uh, and Mike, it was Mike Moore right over there. Uh, yeah. Mike Moore, Young Life guy. Uh, Kenny Walt. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other names. But uh, Young Life on Monday nights is where I was comfortable. Um, and I always look forward to the Monday night Young Life meeting uh, for Bel Air High School because you're with all your people you go to school with. And it, for me, it was night and day different from what I felt at church. And um, Young Life was where you could be yourself. Um, the, the gospel was presented in a non-threatening way. Uh, you know, it was presented on a silver platter for you to really look at and decide for yourself as a person, you know, is this the path I want to go in, in life? And uh, I, I just connected with Young Life. Um, still friendships, even now, with my former leaders, uh, the impact they had on me and my friends. Um, and uh, I'll do a quick story. You know, I played, as I mentioned, I played baseball at Bel Air. Every summer, my, my summers were taken up with baseball. Well, after my senior year, I did not play in the summer. I took a summer off before we go, go to Sam Houston. Well, that opened the door for me to finally be able to go to Young Life Camp in the summer, Frontier Ranch at the time. I don't know where they go now, but Young Life has several camps around the nation. Uh, but anyway, I was able to go. I was not able to go earlier in high school when I probably needed it most because I was going on different, different paths that I should have been on. Um, but that worked out where I was able to go. I didn't have as good of a senior year that I, had planned on. I had, had a really good previous summer. Uh, my senior year did not turn out like I wanted it. I, I may have had some other opportunities. So summer baseball was not going to be in my plan that summer. And again, God closed one door, opened that, that other one. And being able to spend a week uh, and experience that Young Life camp, and I don't know if y'all heard stories of, of the way they do things. And man, I do not remember the speaker's name because uh, it's been a long time ago. That was the summer of 85. But um, I just remember the message every night, the build-up each night, delivering the, the gospel message. And, man, it was just like a light bulb moment. Yeah. And I remember one night uh, towards the end of that week, maybe the next to last night, uh, after the, the club that evening and the, speech, the, the talk that night, they told us, you know, all right, Venture out by yourself. Don't go in groups. You go by, go by yourself. Find a spot where you can just have some quiet time. And I remember doing that. And uh, I remember I grabbed a spot, I believe it was near the, the pool on the side of the camp. And there was a bunch of people there, but everybody was kind of spread out on their own chairs. But um, just reflecting back on the message that you heard during the course of that week. And uh, for some there, it was just another week, but for many of us, it was a different, it was a life-changing week. And uh, I remember that night, man, looking up, you know, praying and just, you know, I'd heard what I'd heard. I knew that what I had been missing had been presented, and that's, that's where my life changed. That's where I gave my life to Christ, and it's through Young Life. And to this day now, Young Life obviously means a lot to me. Uh, I try to support it whenever I can, and when we were in... Uh, in, in Beaumont, when I started my TV career, I immediately hooked up with the Young Life leader in Beaumont. My wife and I ended up being, we got married about six, eight months later, and she joined me in Beaumont, and we became leaders 
took kids to the same camp I went to, which was unique. Um, just giving back to the, to the group that meant so much to me. And, uh, you know, here we are now. Uh, it's still a journey. You know, a lot of steps forward, steps back, like all of us deal with. Uh, but I go back to, the, to, the, to where it all began for me, where it really clicked, and that That's was awesome. Young Life, summer yeah. of 85. Yeah, same in my life. You know, somebody invited me to Young Life Club. Uh, young yeah. Life Club. Yep. And I walked in that first night, and I go, I had no idea. What, I was a pretty anti-religious guy. Yeah. And I walked in that night, and I said, I have no idea what that guy up front's talking about. <laughs> but I love being here, and I'm coming back. Right, and, right. And, uh, you know, kept coming back and, and discovered that Jesus was very different yeah. than what my biases had told me. You know, his compassion, his courage, and what he had done with his life to make a way for me yeah. to know him. And it's it just beautiful. So thanks for you, that. Well, you mentioned experiences, and I, and I want to just tell a quick story, if you don't mind. Just, yeah. um, you know, what my relationship with Christ has meant and how it's got me through, you know, difficult times because uh, it's real easy when we're going when things are going really well it's easy to trust god and everything you do mm -hmm. it's when you're challenged when things aren't going well how do you respond and um i went through a situation um in the fall of 2019 so uh, that would have been the second world series run for the astros if y'all remember and um went through a health situation and it was Something that really um, I struggled with because being in a position that I do, it's a very visible position. I'm on the air every night. And uh, I was going through a situation that fall where um, I was losing a lot of weight. If y'all watch, I don't know if y'all remember, I lost about 30 pounds and didn't know what was going on. My wife was like, slow down, you know, because when I work in the football season, I'm grinding. It's, it's a grind. And she was, I was like, ah, it's just, it's football season. It's just, you know, I'm not eating well, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I kept losing weight, didn't know why. So went through the World Series run. That was a playoff. I covered each round of the playoffs. I remember it was Boston, New York, Washington. It was it Washington that year. So that whole month of October, man, I was on, I hardly slept and was working every, you know, I was worn out. And finally she got me to go in and get blood work done and everything, major stuff checked out fine and um but and i was also having a back problem a lower back problem as well a lot of pain that i've never had before and uh, that lingered on so that december after the world series i went in and it my wife because you know they always the wives and mothers always know what's going on right so uh she said your blood sugar's out of control I'm like what what are you talking about and uh well type 2 diabetes runs in my family and uh, it can hit anybody that doesn't matter how much you weigh. You know, it's just, sometimes it's a weight thing, but sometimes it's not, it's inherited. So I, I go in and finally got all that done and that turned out to be part of the problem. Uh, and my body was just out of sync. And um, I went in and sure enough, blood sugar, A1C was like a 15, which is like, if y'all know anything about that, that's not good. Um, I was quickly on medication. My sugar level was like 350. It's like, and she was just shaking her head like, changes are coming, man, changes are coming. <laughs> and um, so uh, I, I say that, and it lingered into the spring, pandemic hit uh, into the summer. It was about an eight month thing for me before my body kind of, you know, through medication and stuff, and I got it under control, but I, you talk about experiences and just relying on your faith. Um, when I was dealing with that, it, it was already, already difficult because, uh, you know, I'd have viewers writing in, Randy, we watch you every night. Are you okay? We're praying for you. Are you okay? You know, it starts playing with you a little bit when you're in a kind of a visible position. And, um, but you still got to kind of grind through and try to do the job every night. But at night I would go home and I, I couldn't, I, when I laid down, too much pain. I had a bird, uh, uh, disc problem, lower back, and I would get up at three in the morning in pain, and I would just lay there, stretch, and I would literally just start question, God, why are you doing this to me? You know, you go to that through that stage, like, why am I going through this? Why am I sitting here on the floor at three in the morning, every night, sleeping two hours a night? You know, heal me. You know, and. Um, but anyway, it tested my faith. Uh, it's, it's, you know, 
It's great when you're on the mountaintop, but when you're in the valleys too, you've got to go to go to Him. Uh, take your concerns, your worries to Him, and you know I learned a lot. It, it tested my faith during that period of time, and got through the spring, summer, a lot of appointments, and uh, got everything back on track, and uh, got my appetite back because my appetite wasn't good because I was in too much pain to eat. I just didn't feel like eating. It was a really, it's a stretch I hope I never go through again, but I learned a lot from it. And uh, by that summer, I turned the corner, got my weight back, and I was ready to roll that fall. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah, thanks for that. So, uh, you know, when your job, in one part of it, starts at 10 o'clock at night and, and, and runs yeah. to 10.30, the visible part, right? Yeah. You, you've got to have, like, a crazy schedule. I do, uh, and yeah. then the weekends and events, and, and then you got a family, a wife, and two kids. Yeah. And uh, so I know that one of the things that everybody struggles with is it would be kind of two different things. So that whole work-life balance, and right. then we're talking about you know walking with God in mm -hmm. the middle, of, like mm -hmm. and finding time to to sort of feed yourself, you know, spiritually, et cetera. How do you handle all that? You know, it's a challenge. It's something I've had to continue to work on, and I think we got a couple pictures too. If, uh, if you pop them up, some of my, my family, my wife and I, Tammy, have been married 33 years. Uh, there she is, right there. She's the rock. I definitely married up. Uh, she's awesome. Um, these are some pictures. She's the head of school at Logos Prep. Um, I've learned a lot during our marriage. Uh, man, she's she's awesome. She's up at five. I mean. Nothing detours her from her time with God. Uh, and I've learned, and I want to be able to do what she does. She's up at 5 a.m. every day. Her quiet time, that's, that's, that's how she starts her day. She's in the Word every single day. Doesn't waver. Uh, great wife, uh, mother. Um, our kids are maybe one of these pictures, too. Our kids are out of the house. Our oldest is... Uh, uh, Courtney, the one in the middle, she's 26. Keely is 24, and that's her husband, Noah. They live in Arkansas. Courtney lives in Dallas. She went to A&M, and uh, she works for Deloitte. Keely and Noah, she, Keely's a, a school teacher. Noah's in year two of med school. Uh, they're further away, which is difficult. Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, we don't get to see them as much, but uh, you know what, if, if, you, if I go back, and sometimes I'll ask the girls, you know, when they were little, something that was really important to me is, uh, in, in the job we do, you know, we're on, um, most days I'm on 5, 6, and 10 o'clock, most days. Uh, sometimes 4, 5, 6, and 10. But our days are not just the shows. Our days are, hey, I might have to be at NRG Stadium at 11 a.m. for practice, like Friday like this Friday morning, I'm actually off, but I'll be at rookie camp because you got to be there. And uh, so you, you're, all, you're all across the board when it comes to schedules. And uh, you've got to force yourself to not, I mean, you want to do your job. You want to do it at a high level. You want to have success. I mean, every, all of us should strive for that. But you've got to find a balance. And uh, you got to find and make time for family. you got to push things aside lock in on the kids and you know did I miss some events with the kids growing up sure I think we all do but a lot of times it might have been a deal a, a game or cheerleading event whatever they're involved with that maybe I was there for part of it and had to leave you know they saw me they knew it was important for me to be there and I you know I've asked them over the years was I there enough and they noticed it they, they knew I was and that's that's important to me uh, but even now, in an empty nest life, with the kids gone, Tammy's extremely busy running uh, things at Logos Prep. Her schedule's uh, crazy as well, especially during the school year itself, as is mine. So we joke now, but we do it. We have to. Every Sunday, uh, after church and lunch or whatever, before I go to work, because I work on Sundays, and I'm off this time of the year on Fridays and Saturdays for the most part, but we pull out the calendar. We, just, we have to make it. You have, to, you have to be intentional. You have to make, make sure you're, you're sitting together, making time for one another, making, making sure you got some meals together, or meeting somewhere, and not just ships in the night, and you look up, another week is gone, and you know, you've missed opportunities to be together. Uh, you, 
you've got to be intentional. You've got to make sure you put time and effort into it. Yeah. And that's something that we put a, a premium on. And uh, sometimes it's brief. Sometimes I've got to be gone. Uh, if I'm on the road with teams, she knows in October, last several years of the Astros, that she's not going to see me a lot in the month of October. <laughs> Uh, football season is an animal by itself. She kind of knows August to January, my schedule changes. I'm um, getting pulled in a lot of different directions with what, what we do, but she's a trooper. She knows the business. Uh, when we first got married in 1990, I, I kind of told her this is kind of what I'm getting into. Um, this is the demands of the job. Um, if it's something I'm going to do long term, and yeah, uh, doesn't mean she always likes it, but she. Uh, she understands it, and it's funny thing is, my wife's not even a sports fan, and uh, so I got to explain a lot of stuff to her. But now she just knows something's going on in October with the Astros. She half the time she doesn't know who they're playing, and she doesn't even know who's in the Super Bowl half the time. So, uh, but it's fun. But uh, but we, uh, we we you have to make time to be together. You got to put that phone down. I'm on my phone with me. I guess I left it over there. You got my phone? All right, my body. Don't lose that phone. I panic when I've misplaced my phone because I got a lot of names and numbers in there that I rely on. Um, yeah, no, we got an auction going. We have an opening bid for Randy's phone. No, it's like losing your wallet. Yeah. Oh, she's calling me. Okay, I'll get back to her. <laughs> um, no, but uh, you've got to put that phone down because everybody knows these phones can pull you and you'll be on, you know, definitely the, the kids in this generation now, they're growing up with these things. And uh, sometimes you just got to, shut those phones down, put them away. Uh, you know, sometimes by habit at a dinner, I'll be checking something briefly and she'll look at me with that look that I know what she said, put that phone down. Uh, but you know what, it's, it's a, you got to break from it. You got to yeah. focus on relationship and, um, you know, spending time with one another. Um, uh, but yeah. it's been a great 33 years. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah sort of the tagline to Toolbox and that if you've been around, you've probably heard to say is we, we want to help men go beyond success into significance. So there's no question uh, this, this mm -hmm. long of a run as sports director at one place. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty successful. You know, what you've yeah. had the opportunity to do and what you've done really, really great. So what we say is we want to help men go beyond success into significance, you know, and in something of impact uh, that goes above and beyond that. So, uh, I know that, you know, you've mentioned Lagos Prep and your, your wife and that and your involvement there and you've done some things with your dad and anything yeah. else. That, that, what comes to your mind when you hear that idea of going beyond success in the significance? Yeah, I mean, that's, a good, that's a good question. And we'll pop up pictures of my dad, too, because I, I want to tell a quick story tied to that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think we all want to be successful in everything we do. God wants us to want that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think sometimes you have to just stop and pause and say, okay, that's, that's great, but it's, it's, it's temporary as well. And the significant side of that is more of a, a, a lasting impact that you can make. And at least for me, um, I mean, I look back at my, my career, you know, this picture with my dad, I look back at my career and yeah, I mean, people would look at it and say, that's a successful career. You, you, in this case, I've been at one station a long time, had some stops, been able to stay in Texas. I've been honored a few times. That's, that's great, but you can't take that with you anywhere, you know what I'm saying? Um, and for me at least, sometimes I just pause and reflect and say, okay, you've, you've put me in a position to have success. Now, how can I make an impact on other people using that platform? And I feel like God gives me a platform to do that, whether it's events like this or mm -hmm. speaking to youth groups. I love spending time with, with kids of all ages, but definitely high school kids um, because they're about to go off to college and can be pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, I, you know, if, 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 if I can impact one kid or one person, I, you know, I'll take that any day. Yeah. Um, but learning to serve has been something that's been on my mind and, and heart in doing it consistently, uh, whether it's at your church, uh, whether it's serving others, reaching out to others, building relationships, uh, you know, just being there for people, witnessing to people. That's a hard thing for me to do. Uh, that's one thing that I look at now that I feel like I've probably failed in some opportunities is 
I'll walk away saying, man, I, I'm in that, I was with this whatever person, a friend or coworker, whatever it might be. It's like, you know, I'm, I know down deep, you know, I can make an impact and, yeah. you know, they may be looking, seeking, uh, finding a church home, whatever it might be. And I feel like I don't take that step because it's like, all right, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I don't present it the right way and it turns them away and I fail at it? Do I have a fear of failure, right? Um, but making that impact is something that's important for me and spending time to, to serve. And I think it's, as the years kind of go on, I feel like I've had opportunities to do that and, and, and haven't done it to quite the level that, I've, that I know God expects and wants. Um, and I, I do want to tell a quick story if we can, this is my dad and I a couple of weeks ago, and something that's been on my heart, or probably the last few years, you get to a point where your parents are getting older, and you know, a lot of things start circulating, like um, you know, this how you use your time. Um, and my dad's 85 years old, these were taken last month. He doesn't look 85, does he? Um, we had a chance, we've been trying to go to the Masters at Augusta. 15 plus years through the uh, lottery system they did. Had never gotten it. And in early December, we, I got a call from a friend of mine who had connections to family tickets. And I, I think somebody who was gonna use them that normally uses them had to back out for whatever reason. And he knew my dad and I had been um, trying to go, kind of a bucket list trip. He, his whole life he's wanted to go. And uh, I, I remember I got the call in early December, because it was well before Christmas, and my friend said, uh, explain the situation. He said, you gotta buy them, but it's just face value, because you, know, you can't jack the price up. And uh, they're, they're yours. I've got, I know you and your dad have been wanting to do this. Uh, they're yours for the first and second round. It's like, man, that's one I would have taken practice round. Um, but it's for the first and second round, and uh, you know, it might be a good Christmas present. So, I remember we surprised my dad at Christmas, and I always get him a Joe State Bank shirt or something. That's what I normally get. So, a little bit of an upgrade this year. Yeah, a little upgrade. Yeah. So my wife and I were saying, "All right, let's get, let's let's jazz this thing up. Let's get a Joe State Bank box." So we went over there and got one, and uh, we ordered uh, Augusta National golf balls. We ordered uh, off Amazon Augusta National flag, all that kind of stuff, and she made off the line of fake tickets and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, all, I will always remember this. Uh, my dad and his wife were at my house and he opened it up and he was totally confused. Like, wait, we didn't get the lottery. What, what is this all about? And I said, dad, we're going to Augusta. Yeah, that's awesome. And tears, and I mean, it was a meaningful peer, a few moments with my dad. And, but it just goes back to the time thing and, and something that's been on my heart is just how do we use our time? Yeah. You know, we can get consumed by work very easily. Um, I know I do at times, but we only have so much time here to make a difference on earth. Uh, um, yeah. You know, Rick Warren, the pastor out of California said, you know, it's a special, time is a special gift because of the amount we have to use. And one of my things that I'm focusing on is, is using time, time with my dad. That was a three day period I'll never forget with my dad. And my advice to people is whoever it is in your life, family member, friends that you wanna reconnect with, whoever, whoever it is, you know, push that reset button a little bit, yeah. pause and, you know, use your time wisely while you got it. That's outstanding. Well, I tell you what, speaking of time, if we're going to give the these guys a chance for a question. Or two, let's do it. Let's do it. So anybody got a question for Randy? Yeah. 12.50, we got what, 10 minutes, right? Okay. Okay, let's start over here. It's interesting that today I happen to hear uh, Jim What are your feelings and what is your, what are your fellow broadcasters' feelings about a basketball player that makes it to the 
top of the EPA and sacrifices it for his own uh, personal conviction. I don't know the whole story you're talking about, but um, you know, I, all I can say is um, one of the things I enjoy doing when I, in, in my job, is building relationships with players. Um, you know, we cover what they do in their sport because that's what the people are watching them do. I like connecting with these athletes uh, and coaches uh, to learn what they're all about away from their sport. And I've been privileged uh, to uh, be able to cover athletes in all sports that, uh, and many of them, put faith first. And from my seat, I love it. Some, some others that don't get it, they don't agree with it. Um, they, they put it in perspective. It's, it's like anything. They know they have a successful career. They're making a lot of money doing it. Um, but they also know what's most important in life, and it's faith and family first. So from my standpoint, I love it. When I interview guys, uh, and not all broadcasters will do this, and you know, I listen to all the interviews I do and uh, that maybe come in remotely, and if it's a guy I know or, or female, male, female or male that I know that, uh, is a believer and they're using that in their press conference or whatever, man, I'm not afraid to air it. Yeah, right on. I, I, I'm not afraid to put it on the air at all. Good. So, I like it. I hate it. Thanks for being here. But yep. It's paying them in, NIL. Uh, NIL? In, talking about NIL? Yeah. That's a hot topic right now. Uh, I'm not saying the players don't deserve some of it. They bring a lot of money to these athletic programs. Uh, I do think it needs a lot of structure right now. It's getting out of control um, quickly. You've got now players that can jump into the portal if they're not happy. Uh, university, I'll just use University of Houston just a week ago. They finished spring football practice. Their top returning uh, running back, actually he's coming off injury, but the year before last, Alton McCaskill, Great season. He'd gotten hurt, coming back. Went through spring ball. After spring ball ended, I mean, you get that deep into it in April, you're about to hit summer. And I don't know the circumstances, so I'm not judging. I'm not going to go there because I don't know. But just what the NCAA is allowing is what I'm, my point is going to be. He went in to, to coach Dana Holgerson and after a weekend and said, I'm going to the portal. I'm out. And caught everybody off guard. Well, here we are in April. You know, you can still go back and try to fill holes, but it becomes more difficult. Like, I think if they're allowed to do that and leave, there should be a cutoff point. Let's say football, for example. Football ends in, what, December? They play a bowl game, whatever. You should, in my opinion, you should set a hard date, February 1st, February 15th at the latest. After that, you can't enter the portal until the next year. You're committed. That way coaches know what they've got coming back. There's not a scramble for guys. It is out of control right now. And there's a lot of money floating around. There's, there's schools enticing players to come. In the portal, we can pay you more if you come play with us. And there's no structure from the NCAA. I, I don't think they plan very well for that. Uh, you had spoken about the value of the relationship and the mentorship from Tim Melton. Yeah. Oh, nice. I have, yeah. I, uh, one thing we do is we have a lot of, uh, and, and I'll get, it's funny, I'll randomly get during the course of a year, I don't know, a dozen, I'll just say that, uh, young broadcasters that are from Houston that have gone into co gone to college and are very early on in their careers working in a tiny market, you know, grinding away, making next to nothing. Um, and I'll get often get a lot of emails. Hey, can you give me some advice? Um, what would you tell me in my situation where I am now? Um, do you have time to talk on the phone or Zoom or whatever? And that's very important to me. And um, I'm, uh, because I was in their shoes, and I'm not, just because I advanced and made it to a top market like Houston, that, that means you say, okay, I got it. Yeah, you're 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 on your own now. <laughs> I don't operate that way. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely for that. We also have interns that come through our program at Channel 2. We'll have, a, we'll have an intern or two this summer, as a matter of fact. And they might be local. They may be coming from another school regionally. Um, 
and you build a little relationship with them and you quickly find out what makes them tick and you, you kind of file away. It doesn't, it doesn't take me too long to know when a kid comes through internship if, if they've got the right mindset to really attack what they want to do in this business um, or if they just want to get the credit you know, for college. So uh, you figure that out, but man, we've had some good ones over the years. But yeah, definitely they reach out. You try to make time, even if it's brief, they send you their, a lot of times they send you, I'll get like a list of questions. I'll just answer the questions. Sometimes they send me a link of their work to ask me to look at it and critique it. And I'll spend a few moments to do that. And uh, so I, I enjoy doing it. I want to get back because, you know, I'm not going to be doing this forever. There's got to be some new guys rolling through here, right? Yeah, thank you. I'm in no rush to leave though, so I still so, like that. All right, I, I, we, we've got to wrap it up. You know, you, you live on the air, so we also have a commitment that we yeah. make sure we have guys out of the room by, by one o'clock. But uh, I got two thank yous, and the first one is the thanks to Randy for being here today. You guys win. Thank you very much. Outstanding. Thanks.